Okay, so it's 10 o'clock. Let's get started with the webinar. I'm so excited. Um, I am Hannah Can. I am the Coastal Stewardship Coordinator with the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation. I'm so excited today to be bringing you a webinar about plastic pollution on Lake Huron. Um, this is an issue that we've been tackling for a number of years and it's one that we get a lot of questions about, especially from our, um, our lake landowners. So we'll start off introducing the Coastal Center. So if you aren't familiar with the Coastal Center, we are a nonprofit uh, charitable environmental organization. Uh, we are founded in 1998 with the goals of protecting and restoring Lake Huron's coastal environment and promoting a healthy coastal ecosystem. We run a ton of different programs uh, that would not be possible without the support of our donors and our sponsorships. Uh, so thank you very much if you are a donor or a sponsor. We really appreciate having you. We are able to do beach cleanups, shoreline restoration projects, community workshops, and even webinars uh, like this one today. And we are also launching our youth program, which is the Coastal Conservation Youth Corps this year, which is very exciting. As soon as we get the go-ahead for health and safety, we will be launching that program. So thank you to our funders. This webinar series is coming to you through two programs, the Coast Watcher Citizen Science Program, which is funded by Bruce Power and TD Friends of the Environment Foundation, and also through our Green Ribbon Champion Program, which is a restoration program uh, for lakeshore landowners, and that's funded through NWMO. So thank you so much to our funders. So let's start at you know a thousand foot level. We know that there's plastic pollution in our environment. Uh, and we know about, or we've at least heard about these Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So right here we see that there's two gyres in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, but there's also a few more gyres that exist, uh, including the North Atlantic Gyre, the South Pacific Gyre, the Indian Ocean Gyre, and the South Atlantic Gyre. So um, it's not just restricted to that Pacific area. But did you know that only the North Pacific Gyre contains more plastic than the Great Lakes. There have been a number of studies done by some of our amazing partners like Lisa Erdl and uh, a few other really awesome people that uh, are on our website if you want to check them out. Lake Superior, Huron and Erie together contain double the number of plastic items per square meter compared to the South and North uh, Atlantic gyres. So, that's a pretty phenomenal amount of plastic. I mean, when you look out on Lake Huron, you don't really expect that it's swimming in plastic, but truly it is. And they've done cross sections using trawling boats um, and, and discovered this. So it's, it's quite unfortunate. We also have a really amazing citizen science, scientist pair, uh, Scott and Acadia Parent. Acadia is just a young environmentalist and they did a study of deep water um, microplastic samples and some other really amazing samples uh, last year. So you can find them on Instagram too. They're one of our great partners. So in 2018, we launched the program, the Lake Huron Microplastic Awareness Project. And what this did was through our Coast Watchers program, we asked our Coast Watchers and other willing volunteers to collect a Nalgene bottle, just a water bottle, full of water. So they waded out into the near shore, they collected the water sample and they sent it back to us. And nine out of 10 of these water samples contained microplastics. And here you see an image through a microscope of these small microfibers. So these microfibers are actually plastic fibers that are used to make clothing like um, fleece sweaters, for example. And this infographic down here just shows that it's been calculated that 600 metric tons of plastic enter Lake Huron every year. That's 40 dump trucks a year just dumping waste right into our lake, which is absolutely amazing. So when we're talking about the different types of plastic pollution, it can be kind of overwhelming. So we're gonna break down the different types of plastic pollution and how we deal with those in this webinar. So we have pre-production plastic, like is shown in the left hand of your screen. These are nurdles. I'm sure a lot of you are probably familiar with seeing these washing up on the beach. We definitely see them a lot in Goddard. That's where our office was based out of. And when, when, whenever we went down to the beach, they were there. Um, these are individual pieces of plastic that are, get melted down into other plastic items. 
And then post-production plastic over here are small pieces of plastic that are broken down over time. So as you can see here, there's a shotgun shell casing, there's a piece of a beach toy, um, a little water bottle lid. So they're really anything that has been a product that has broken down over time in the environment. I'm also going to try and um, keep up with any questions people have. So if you have any questions as we go, feel free to, to ask away. So the sizes of plastic pollution have actually been divided down into five different categories, believe it or not. Uh, we have nanoplastics. These are extremely small. You can't see them with the naked eye. They're less than a micron. And a micron is 0 0.001 of a millimeter, so extremely small. And as you can see in this, this image, the difference between a microbead, which is already very small, you usually can find them in hand soaps, and then a nanoplastic, so they're extremely small. Microplastics, like microbeads, mesoplastics, these are five millimeters to 2.5. These are things we often find on the beach, like the shotgun shells, like the water bottle lids. And then we have macroplastics. These are larger, 2.5 centimeters to a meter. So that's actually a huge range of items. The bulk of what we find on Lake Huron fit in the meso and macro plastics category. And then the last is mega plastics. These are the big things, the over a meter, so tires, um, big industrial plastic bins, um, fishing nets often fit in this category. Question, what was the plastic thing in the last frame? A shotgun shell, I keep finding lots, yes. Shotgun shell um, casing. Okay, so, I mean, the question really becomes, these items are, permeated throughout our entire environment, whether you're right on the lake shore, whether you're walking a trail on a river that attaches to Lake Huron, whether you're in a park, looking in the gutter outside your house, these plastics are everywhere. Um, so how do you clean them up or what, like, what is the best method to do that? So nanoplastics, those very, very tiny microscopic ones, only the smallest water filters can filter those out, like the filtrol, and I'll talk about that, that really cool device in a little bit. With microplastics and mesoplastics, we often have to use sifting devices. Um, that could be um, even just like a splatter guard, like one of those bacon splatter guards for a frying pan. We use those often on beaches. But with mi microplastics, they're so small, like less than five millimeters, prevention is really the best method. And then mesoplastics, hand picking. So at our beach cleanups, we often see people down right down at the sand, hand picking um, these plastics out of the environment. So it's very tedious and it's, as you can see by this little triangle over here, uh, the smaller the plastic is, the more difficult it is to clean up out of the environment. Macroplastics, so these are, you know, 2.5 to a meter. They're usually really easy to hand remove or using removal machines. So in the bottom right hand corner here, you can see uh, a uh, barber surf rake, and I'll talk about these a little bit later too, but they are really great at um, removing macro plastics off beaches. And then of course, the mega plastics, the over a meter, that's hand removal, or sometimes even machines have to come in and, and pull them out, which is extremely resource intensive. Often it's hard to get machinery out on a beach or there's bylaws against doing that. So um, easy to pick up, but challenging to get out of different environments. So I'll just move my little face here. Nanoplastics, these are those tiny microscopic ones. The problem with these plastics is that they're the same size as phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are the very, very extremely small organisms that live in water that a lot of fish and small like minnows and, and even smaller um, benthic invertebrates feed on. So as you know about bioaccumulation, um, if there's a hundred phytoplankton that consume plastic or that are close to plastic and then uh, an animal eats those and then a bigger animal eats that, then all the chemicals that are contained on that plastic within that plastic get higher and higher and higher in toxicity the larger the animal goes up until humans where we end up having the highest toxicity. Um, Nanoplastics accumulate in animal digestive systems. They carry pollutant hitchhikers. 
which is what I was talking about with the bioaccumulation. They toxify the animal's body and the water that they're in. So that's, that's what a big problem is with the nanoplastics. The remedy, reducing our consumption of plastic is a huge one. Reusing items, recycling items, as we know, up to 90% of plastic does not get recycled depending on where you are, even if it gets put into that recycling stream. So that's a huge challenge for us in our society. So reducing and reusing are definitely the two first steps. Stopping entry into the environment is number one. And then with the nanoplastics that exist in our environment already, because it's so small and there's so much organic matter that is similar size or larger, it's extremely hard to filter through to only target those nanoplastics. So it's really challenging to undo the damage that has been done. With microplastics, that's one millimeter to five millimeters. So if you think about microbeads or even nurdles in some cases, um, they also carry toxins. They're also very hard to clean up and they're very hard to find a source. I mean, we have been working with Lakeshore landowners for almost a decade, trying to locate the source of where these nurdles are coming from. Environment Canada has looked to see where <laughs> where nurdles come from and it's so hard to peg a source because there's no brand name written on them. So again microplastics also bioaccumulate in wildlife carrying those toxins with them and as we see in this microscope image from before that little fiber is considered a mi microplastic. So this is the filtrol. this is the device I was telling you about. And I don't have one installed in my house or else I would go and show you. <laughs> I'm looking at getting one but my laundry room is under renovation right now. Um, but what you do with a filtrol is it has a small bag within this unit and it has a filter. So your water goes into your washing machine, washes your clothes, and then it comes out. And when it comes out, uh, you would hook this filtrol unit up into that outspout. The water would travel through the filtrol and back out into the water system thereby catching all of these small microfibers or other small plastic pieces that might be um, <laughs> hitchhikers on your clothes. So it's a really effective way of dealing with microfiber waste. Uh, and we are actually auctioning one of these off at our conference in the, um, in the silent auction. So if you're coming to our conference, feel free to uh, keep your eye out for the filtrol. I will be bidding on it, so challenge accepted. <laughs> um, so the next size is mesoplastics. Those are five millimeters to 2.5 centimeters. So that second largest category. Um, they're very hard to clean up because they're so small. Think about nurdles. And as you see, there's a little colander down here full of mesoplastics. There's a huge buildup of these in the lake, both pre-production and post-production plastics. Um, and in order to effectively clean this up, it's gonna take a long time, um, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. Like I was mentioning, it's really hard to control the release of these types of plastics, especially because a lot of them, the post-production, are larger plastic items that get eaten up by the lake, made smaller, and then washed back up on the beaches. So forgotten beach toys are often something we find, even small little like Lego pieces or Lego men heads. Um, they're very common to find. Um, and then animal consumption occurs. So anything that is white or light yellow often gets mistaken by animals as eggs. So they consume this not knowing that it's not an egg and it's plastic in it. And then we see all these photos of birds with their stomachs full of plastic. So the remedy for this size of plastic is really to, again, reduce our use of plastic, reusing plastics we already have, and then recycling and to really just clean it up out of the environments, um, which is challenging, especially in some remote environments. Uh, one item that we see a lot of that ends up fitting into this size category is foam. So if you are familiar with, um, with the lake shores and even up on the Bruce Peninsula, Georgian Bay, there's often huge amounts of foam pieces that get washed up and uh, they become a, a huge hazard for wildlife. And then macroplastics. So these ones are usually pretty easy to hand clean up off the beach. So whenever we do a beach cleanup, these make up the majority of the waste that we collect. Um, 
they're so they're easy to clean up, but that means that they're also easy for wildlife to get entangled within them, especially fishing gear, nets, ropes, um, fishing line and lures. I know I've walked the beach with my son before and I've found um, fishing lines with lures and hooks on the end, which is extremely dangerous for humans, not just wildlife. Um, jugs and plastic bags are included in that. And one, one thing that we run into a lot is who's responsible for their disposal? Who's responsible for cleaning up a lot of these beaches? And there's conflicting messaging in a lot of areas. In some areas, there are clubs that are formed or community groups that will go out and clean up this stuff, but then how do we pay to, to remove it? As in, do you just put it in your own garbage bin? Do you partner with the municipality? Um, it's, it, that's a very challenging topic for a lot of communities. And then this, this thought about waste escape. So this is unintentional littering. It could be a garbage can on a beach with no lid. You put your garbage in the garbage bin, but then a seagull comes and pulls it out or a wind, wind gust blows and blows it away. Um, so that's a huge problem too. And that's really an infrastructure problem. So remedies for these types of plastics include securing garbage containers on shorelines or even up in river deltas. You know, everything that happens on our landscape ends up in Lake Huron. So if we can help reduce litter upstream, it'll help the lake as well. Educating about the importance of removing wash up and disposing pro properly on private property. So a lot of people I know who live on the lake shore, they clean up their beach all the time, like removing plastic debris off their shoreline. Um, but some people don't know that they should or they're not up there enough to do it um, you know, every week or whatever. So education about leaving no trace, pack in, pack out. So we're thinking about visitor areas now, like provincial parks. Um, people who come to the provincial park, they might not know about how litter affects our shoreline. So educating people about the issues is really step number one. So with these macroplastics, I'd mentioned the Barber Surf Rake before. Um, this is an image of a Barber Surf Rake. Barber is a brand name and it's a tow behind unit, as you can see, uh, and it sifts through the upper layer of sand, collecting all the garbage and then dumping it into a reservoir. So it's kind of like a, a lawn mower, but for the beach and it uh, picks up, it's very, very effective at picking up um, garbage off the beach and also grooming the beach or making the beach level. So that's why a lot of municipalities use this machine. But the problem with beach grooming is that in some areas, uh, like this bottom image is Grand Bend Beach, as you probably recognize, and it gets groomed weekly in the summer, but it doesn't see as many negative effects from that grooming because it is a deposition area or an area that constantly gathers sand just naturally through a coastal process. So that sand is always nice and thick and uh, can withstand that type of management to an extent. Whereas up here you see Sobble Beach and Sobble Beach is not a deposition area. So it takes longer for sand to accumulate on that beach, which means that if we groom the beach regularly, we often get these wet patches and you can see on the image in the top right hand corner that there are wet areas of beach. And this is because when the beach is groomed, those tines fluff up the top layer of sand to get any garbage off. But then the sand is, is ruffled up and then when wind blows, because it's nice and fluffy, it just takes the sand away, leaving that lower wet sand, the, the thicker grains. So. This type of beach grooming is not effective or not appropriate for all beach areas and should be, um, should be used with a beach management strategy in mind. So we did a butt-free beach program a few years ago and it was based around cigarette butt um, garbage on beaches. And we did surveys through this program. So we, we surveyed people and asked, how often do you visit a beach on Lake Huron or this beach and then we asked people if they believe that that beach that they were on that day had a litter problem. So as you can see the beaches that were surveyed uh, we had 403 respondents so a lot of people visit the beach either it was their first time once a year or once a month and 
what we found in our results was extremely inconsistent, surprisingly. Um, and this was based off of, uh, we also compared it to how often beaches were groomed. So we took a, a survey here um, of all the beaches that were part of the Butt Free Beach program. And we looked at how often they groomed, how they groomed, what their annual grooming budget was, um, and then the percent of respondents that thought the beach had a, a litter problem. So our results were inconclusive. It, it, they were all over the map. All of this data is also available for free in our resources under our coastal action plan that was published in 2019. So if you wanna read up on this in a little bit more uh, detail, you can look it up on our website under coastal action plan. So, you know, it, it was very challenging to glean any results from this study. So what that tells us is that a larger investment of money in beach grooming doesn't often equate to people visiting the beach having a better experience or feeling like the beach is cleaner. So kind of ironic. <laughs> Another thing that we found <clears throat> through our coastal action plan, our recommendations, was that um, we know that beach groomer machines like the Barber Surf Rake aren't really the best method from a beach management standpoint. And if a municipality has a $20,000 a year budget, specifically for beach grooming, um, we could translate that into increasing employment in our communities instead of having one person running a tractor with this machine for 30 minutes, three times a week. <clears throat> we can pay staff a living wage which in Huron County is $17.55 a month, or sorry, a month, an hour. Um, <clears throat> and we can use that to determine staff time for human labor. So we can actually have uh, two people out on the beach for five days a week, hand grooming the beach. Um, this is better for the environment. It's better for our local economy because we're employing people. And it can be a really cool uh, work experience because we could survey the plastics that we are collecting. So this is just, you know, uh, a pipe dream, kind of a, a cool idea, just a comparison to show um, that, you know, we only have a certain amount of money, but there are many different ways to, to use that money uh, in our community. So finally, the biggins, the mega plastics over a meter. Um, they're, so the problem is that they're often so large that you need to have heavy machinery to remove them or you need to actually take them to a dump in order to dispose of them properly. And the question again arises, who pays for this removal or disposal? Uh, we can't track where a lot of it comes from. I mean, some of the, the tires that I've seen wash up on Bayfield Beach, for example, are from, like you can tell they're very, very old. <laughs> so, um, you know, you can't go back in time and stop it from happening. Uh, these types of plastics can entangle wildlife or remove wildlife habitat like this paddle pedal board pedal boat at the bottom here um, it could be sitting on a snake hibernaculum which could be reducing habitat i mean who knows right um, it all depends on what part of the shoreline that you're on and of course there's human health risks uh, to having this stuff floating in our near shore environment where we swim um, you know, it could cause entanglement for children, getting their foot caught in a tire that's in the nearshore waters or fishing net. And it can also damage boat equipment. So if we have this stuff floating around in our nearshore um, and you, you, know, you think about boat propellers coming in and out of marinas, it can entangle and damage this boat equipment. So a remedy to this is uh, we often see people who put their patio furniture too close to the lake shore or they forget about it they have a campfire at night or whatever and they forget their patio chairs and then a storm comes overnight and then they wake up in the morning and their patio chairs are gone <laughs> and they wonder i wonder where they went well they're down in sarnia now they've <laughs> floated through the lake shore and they'll wash up down in uh in, in pinery probably um, so properly setting back your patio furniture or tying it down if we have extreme winds we often see umbrellas blowing out into the lake tying watercraft to shores and docks properly so when I say watercraft I could mean anything from this pedal boat down in the corner to small uh, sailboats we see them often getting taken away I know my father's sailboat actually <laughs> was taken away in the wind one time we were able to retrieve it thankfully but uh, it's easy, easily done. You know, you tie a wrong knot and away it goes. 
And then lastly, proper docks for Lake Huron's shores. So uh, one thing we see a lot in spring wash up after the ice has pulled away from the shoreline is people's docks sometimes get pulled away and removed. And they could be large wooden docks but have tires attached to them. So we need to consider all those different um, those different ways that mega plastics get into our our environments. An anonymous person uh, in this webinar says, Goddard has a 45k annual budget. Why is the beach groomed only bi-weekly? Um, I don't know. I'm not part of the municipality, so I can't accurately answer your question. Um, but I think we work very closely with the town of Goddard and the um, Green Goddard group that they listen to us with regards to proper beach management. So grooming a beach is actually not a good practice from a mechanical grooming standpoint, because it removes any plant material. It can expedite erosion. So we recommend hand grooming over mechanical beach grooming. So that's probably why, because they're probably um, adhering to a beach management plan. So back on track, cleaning up nano to mega plastics. How do we do it? Um, how do we do it as in the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation? We host beach cleanups every year since 2015. So this, this would technically be our sixth <laughs> beach cleanup season. Um, we have a garage cleanup usually in March, April, but that was postponed. So we'll do it hopefully in the fall. And as you can see through these numbers, uh, we have cleaned up over a thousand pounds of garbage for many, many of the years. And as we've gone through time, our beach cleanups have, we've had less and less beach cleanups, um, but they've become bigger and bigger. So more volunteers have been coming out to these events. I think last year we had over 400 volunteers come out to our beach cleanup events, which is actually phenomenal. It shows that the community cares. People are, are keen on participating in these types of events, raising awareness about plastic pollution in the environment. And the, the pile of garbage bags here in the bottom right is just from our Great Goddard Shoreline cleanup last year. So pretty amazing, you know, half an hour to two hours worth of a garbage pickup. Um, that's an amazing amount of garbage, you think, and we only do it once a year. And there are really amazing community stewards that go out and, and clean up the beach on their own time. I know that when we had our office in Goddard, I would go out on my lunch break and just bring a bag, pick up a gar uh, bag of garbage, and then go back to the office on my lunch. So you think, okay, so we do our beach cleanups. Um, the garbage that we collect, most of it could probably be recycled, right? Well, surprisingly, um, beach garbage is usually not recyclable, which is really heartbreaking. And this is because the sun breaks down the plastic materials, like you probably know when you have um, lawn furniture out in the sun, it gets faded. Well, it also breaks down the plastic into a lesser quality of plastic, which is harder to recycle. So all this beach garbage that we collect, if it is plastic, sometimes it's metal, but if it's plastic, it all needs to be cleaned before it goes through the recycling system. Uh, and then most of the plastic that gets recycled into other items, like successful recycling, closed loop has to be rigid plastic. So that could be a milk jug or um, a funnel or, or something that's hard. If it's a plastic wrapper, it cannot be recycled. It's basically garbage. So this um, image at the top right, we it's from Head and Shoulders, like the shampoo brand. They have a line of their shampoo bottles that actually uses recycled beach plastics or ocean plastics which becomes these small um, gray nurdles, and they get melted down into the, uh, the shampoo bottles. So these rigid plastics have to be able to be identified and recycled and sorted. So that's, you know, number one, two, three, four, five, six plastic. And then they get melted down, pelletized. So it's lots of, it's very resource intensive. Down here in the bottom right hand of the screen, we see um, different types of other pelletized colorful plastics that I will talk about um, by a really amazing company, local company that we have been dealing with. Um, Doug 
asks in the questions, do you think nurdles come from shipping? They seem to be nurdle spills events when we're suddenly are abundant. I mean, there's a lot of different um, assumptions out there of where they come from because um, there's a lot of plastic manufacturing facilities along all of our Great Lakes. So it, they could come from shipping, they could come from somebody unloading plastics in their parking lot and they spill a little bit in the parking lot and then a rain comes and they get washed into the gutter system and then they go out to Lake Huron. I mean, possibilities are endless really, right? So this is the company I wanted to touch on with uh, these beautiful, colorful um, pellet, plastic pellets. This company is called CR Plastics, CR Plastic Products, and they come out of Stratford and they are like a mom and dad kind of business that ballooned into this amazing, huge um, company that provides plastic furniture all around the world. And they use 100% recycled materials. So we had the pleasure and the amazing opportunity to go and tour their facility um, a few months ago. So in these bottom photos, you see crushed milk jugs that have been recycled, um, water bottle lids, more milk jugs, and then these are the chairs and the tables that they produce. So they grind them all down, they melt it down, they pelletize it, they put colorants in it, and then they make plastic lumber and build chairs. So I actually have two of these chairs out of my deck. I could probably show you because I'm spoiled. So there they are, beautiful Adirondack chairs that have come from CR plastic products. So um, there's, there is a market for recycling this waste. So they actually approached us to see if we could collect certain beach garbage so that they could use it in making a chair, which is such a cool thought to do something like that. Um, but you know, we're, this year it's a we're a little bit off with our beach cleanups. So unfortunately we, we can't do it this year. Um, and then anyway, at the top here is the image of the head and shoulders ocean plastic bottle and TerraCycle, which is another company we'll talk about a bit later. They have a beach plastic cleanup program. So, with recycling all of this waste, <clears throat> as you know, it's very challenging, resource ex extensive, and you need certain facilities in order to do this efficiently. Um, but one thing that we find, this infographic here is just from Goddard specifically, and this data on the left-hand side is from the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, which takes data all across Canada. And it shows that one of the number one most picked up items is cigarette butts. I mean, surprisingly, they're so small, but they make such a huge impact in our, um, in our environments. And if you believe it or not, the filters of these cigarettes are filled with uh, microfibers, plastic microfibers, not cotton or um, inorganic material. That's why they don't disintegrate into the environment. So <clears throat> un unfortunately, um, they're our most found item but fortunately, <laughs> TerraCycle, this uh, really cool company, uh, I think they're based out of Mississauga or the GTA area. They have a cigarette butt recycling program where you can gather all the cigarette butts and then ship them to the company and they will use those microfibers in making pallets, like shipping pallets. So that's a really cool way that we can recycle something that doesn't seem recyclable whatsoever. Uh, they also have, like I mentioned, the beach plastic cleanup program where you can send beach plastics to them, those rigid plastics, one, two, four, five, or six, and they can recycle them or sell, at least clean them and then sell them to people who can use them, like CR Plastics in Stratford. So a real life example of using TerraCycle, <clears throat> and I'm gonna show you their website too in a sec, I'll just move my face. Um, my mom, is like the OG, the original gangster, as I call her, of, um, of recycling and kind of living this eco lifestyle. And she's a huge inspiration. So what she did was she ordered um, a box, like a medium-sized box from TerraCycle. That's all plastic pa packaging waste from her household. So this is her Instagram post on it. Uh, she has a family of three. She collected all of the garbage for their family between January and April, I guess. And it 
it, you know, she washed everything, everything that she could recycle, she put in the regular recycling stream, everything that she could compost, she composted it. And then everything that was, didn't fit into those categories and was plastic packaging waste, she was able to gather in this massive bag. I think she had two huge garbage bags full. And she's also a very um, aware consumer. So she avoids getting these types of plastic products. But as you know, in our society, you can't avoid everything. So for four months, she gathered all this plastic packaging. She compressed it all down into this small box, uh, sucked all the air out of it, and it weighed 13 pounds. So to buy one of these boxes, it cost her $134, and she was able to ship it back to TerraCycle, and they're able to recycle those plastic products. So if you are looking for a way that you can um, reduce your plastic packaging waste or reduce what's going to your landfill, this is an option, and it's honestly not that expensive to do, especially if you are um, an aware consumer. <clears throat> so kudos to TerraCycle. And I'm going to show you guys their website because they have a number of really cool other programs that they run. Um, and a lot of these are free too. Like all you have to do is sign up for their program through the TerraCycle website. They send you a free shipping label and then you just compress everything and ship it to them and then they recycle it. So this is usually based off brand names. So here, um, for Breeze and Swiffer, Boom Chicka Pop, we have Blocks, Bricks, uh, Recycling, <clears throat> Burt's Bees has one, Britta has one, Tweed. Um, one that I was using was the Love Child Organics. This is like baby food pouches. Um, Live, Living Proof, they're a um, shampoo company. Hasbro Toys, you can send them, Gillette Razors. I mean, like the list is endless and it says up here, if the program is free. This means that you just get an account, you sign up to have this shipping label, you print it off, you slap it on the box, you send it away and it gets recycled properly. Like how amazing is that? But not a lot of people know about this opportunity. So it's worth doing some research on if you're interested in that kind of um, waste mitigation in, in your home. So we know it's bad. We know there's a ton of plastics in our environment um, we know they're really hard to clean up. They're really resource intensive to clean. So what do we do? What are the answers? Uh, I can break it into three categories. We can mitigate the sources of the plastic, like where is the plastic coming from? We can remove the plastic from the environment and we can prevent plastic from entering the environment. So I'm gonna give you a few kind of examples of source mitigation. This is voting with your dollar. So reducing where the plastics are coming from. Um, there's a quote that I love. It says, if a bathtub were overflowing, you wouldn't reach for a mop, you would turn off the faucet. And that's what we need to do with plastic pollution or even just plastic products. So this is an example of a one use hand soap. You could take the first step in getting a reusable bottle and then taking it to a bulk refill station. Or you could take it to the next step and avoiding the plastic altogether by just using a bar of soap. And there's lots of different local companies and local artisans that sell um, handcrafted soap. So you can get it from Lush or the Body Shop or any, any eco-friendly um, store that is conscientious about the environment. Another example of source mitigation is making at-home swaps. So taking cling film and then swapping it out for bowl covers. And I will show you guys some examples that I have some of these. So this is a, a big bowl cover that I got as a wedding gift in a package. It has like a little elastic and you just slide it over your bowl. And then I got my sister, my sister is very amazing seamstress and she made me a few extras. So they're super cheap and really easy to make. If you know someone who's good at sewing, they can whip these up in no time flat. Um, you can also buy them at a lot of local artisan shops. So this one is, personal favorite of mine. Um, as someone in the age of going to baby showers, bachelorette parties, birthdays, you name it, we, we often see huge balloon arches or just helium balloons. And then I have, I can't tell you how many people, especially our coast watchers who will email us with pictures of like 10 balloons that wash up on their shoreline in one night. Um, I, <laughs> we don't need to have balloons or ribbon um, to, to celebrate these kind of events. This is this bottom right hand picture is an example of eco-friendly decorations. So these little pinwheels and garlands are made out of paper and they're really inexpensive. You can buy them on Etsy, you can buy them on Amazon, you can make them at home. 
Um, but there is no reason why we can't have eco-friendly decorations instead of these crazy um, wasteful decorations like like these balloon arches. They just drive me nuts. I'm sorry, <laughs> I have to say it. Um, so then step number two, you know, we talked about mitigating. So what can we cut out? Now we have to remove them from the environment once they escape. Um, so shoreline cleanups, river valley cleanups, our annual cleanups you can attend, they're free. Um, there's also some really amazing groups out there that are taking the charge in reducing plastic pollution in their environment, like Keep the Bruce Clean and Green. Um, the Lion's Head have, Lion's Head, the community of, um, they have a harbor club that cleans up the harbor. Bayfield Park Club, they have volunteers that clean up their beach. Uh, Lake Life Studio in Cam Lackey, they're an amazing glass studio. Justine uh, and her group of other amazing empowered female entrepreneurs, they host an annual cleanup every year at Canaterra Park. So it's really easy to become a part of existing cleanups or you can host your own. Um, and you can find a lot of them on shorelinecleanup.ca. This is that great Canadian shoreline cleanup website. So you can join one that already exists, or you can just go out on your family with your family every Sunday onto the shoreline and, and do one on your own. And then number three is preventing plastic from entering our environment. I'll just move my face over here. So again, we talked about reducing first, reusing, and then recycling, and making that a societal norm. So the five R's of zero waste is up in this corner. Refusing plastic, so we go to the grocery store, we see a bag of carrots in a bag, a bag of carrots without a bag. Choose the ones without a bag. They're probably local, which is amazing because we're supporting local farmers and we're refusing to buy something that's in plastic. Encouraging producer responsibility. So this is encouraging groups or, or companies um, to use products without plastic or to not have plastic packaging or to make amazing chairs out of post-consumer recycled plastic. Um, increasing consumer awareness is part of all of these. And then of course, the, um, the ideas of leaving no trace. So when you go on a hike, you pack in, you pack out, you take everything that you brought in there with you back out with you. And then of course, better waste management at public areas. So this could be this example, um, changing the style or the type of garbage can used on shoreline areas. Like this is super easy and, and very inexpensive for a lot of places to do. So in switching from a garbage can like this, where there's a lot of escape or seagulls come and they rip it out or uh, raccoons in the night or whatever wind, um, use garbage cans that have a lid that are sealed and make sure that there's enough of them to accommodate the use or how many people are using that beach. And then diapers. This is another one that gets under my skin. I worked as a summer student or a summer uh, visitor center attendant at Bruce Peninsula National Park. And we would go to Singing Sands or we would go to the grotto um, every morning on a long weekend. And there would, the parking lot would be full of diapers and the trail, there would be diapers on the side of the trail. There would be diapers at the shoreline. Like Packing in and packing out is really easy to do and it just all starts with education or switching the type of diapers you use. I have a two-year-old, I've used um, modern cloth diapers, which are very easy to wash, and I don't have to worry about ever not having a place to, to ditch my diaper. I just put it in my wet bag, away I go. That can be used with lunch snacks, can be used with camping gear. Pack in, pack out. So all of this can seem very daunting, very um, abysmal. <laughs> We can lose faith in our society, but I want you to have hope. Um, we are seeing amazing societal change starting, especially with the ban the bag or straws suck. Um, a few years ago, it was like the year of the straw. Everyone was trying to ditch that straw. Uh, so, you know, people are becoming more aware. And then looking at this circular economy diagram, you know, we have our source, we have to produce something, they sell it, we use it then we can repair it, then we can reuse it, we can refurbish it, we can recycle it instead of it just going into the landfill. So focusing on that circular economy is really important. More businesses, especially local businesses on the coast are becoming really amazing advocates for reducing uh, plastic waste. So this is Kate Vale from Kate's Cafe and uh, they are located on the square in Godrich and she switched all of their plastic straws 
to paper straws. And not only that, she went a step further. She looked at all the drink cups that they use. And because Goddard doesn't have a, gar uh, a composting program, she wanted to make sure that the cups that they used were number one recyclable, which number one recycle means it's the easiest to recycle. Number six means it's the hardest. So she consulted with us and we worked with her on making sure that her products were the most recyclable or compostable if they were to escape in the environment. So amazing. Like I mentioned, all these really cool community groups are, are stepping up and, and not just for beach cleanups, but for societal change, um, for producer and consumer responsibility, for business and corporate responsibility. Like Blue Bayfield, they are one of the, the founders and one of the originals of using tap water instead of water bottles in their community. Eco Exeter, an amazing group of high school kids that have started um, petitioning with the, the grocery store stores in town to reduce plastic use in the grocery store. And then Green Goddard, they're another one that kind of <laughs> Uh, emulates both of those and they've been doing a really amazing job um, including in getting um, water bottle refill stations installed all around town at the waterfront you name it they've been amazing so starting today you know we we came we educated ourselves today we watched a webinar um, <clears throat> but what other actions can you take you can hold your own community cleanup when it's safe to do so because of COVID-19. Um, we can't really get together in mass quantities right now, but you can take your kids out um, and just do one. You can take your friends out or who you live with and, and do a beach cleanup, do a shoreline cleanup, clean up the gutter in front of your house, clean up the boulevard. Um, it, it can be in your backyard. I live out in the country. I walk my country road every day and I pick up garbage. Um, you know, any, anything that suits you and where you live, has an impact eventually in Lake Huron. So look up Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. Look up our website to, to find beach cleanups that are happening around you. Make those simple swaps <clears throat> and hold your family accountable. So for example, a lot of people use microfiber cloths like this. You know, this is a simple microfiber cloth. This is all made out of plastic, believe it or not. I mean, they're great, but 100% plastic. So when I wash this, it leaches plastic microfibers through my washing machine. So you can switch to a cotton tea towel, which is even more absorbent, or you can go one step further and get linen. Um, linen is obviously the most expensive, cotton and then, and then plastic microfiber. Um, but those are easy, simple swaps that you can make in your own home. Another one, instead of using sponges, you can use these cellulose, um, dish towels. This one's been used and, and very much loved. This one's brand new. Um, they are compostable when you're done with them. Instead of a plastic sponge that you have to throw in the garbage, these last forever. As you can tell, like I've washed this. This is probably two years old um, and you can easily use those instead. And buy from companies that are using recycled products like CRP uh, out of Stratford. I mean, you pay a little bit more upfront for the chair, but those ones I showed you on my deck, I've had for three years now. I've never taken them inside, even in the winter. And they've taken full sun. They're amazing. And they have, I think, a 20-year warranty. And then when they're done, I, and it, after the 20 years, I can take them back to the company. They can grind them back up and make a fresh new chair out of it if they wanted to, which is absolutely amazing. So look up CR Plastic Products. And then finally, work with your community and municipality to prevent waste escape. So if you constantly go to um, a local public beach and you're noticing that plastic is getting out or people are leaving plastic in the parking lot that's on the beach, talk to your municipality in a friendly, nice, kind way. Say you wanna be a help and you have a suggestion. Um, maybe they need more garbage pails. Maybe they need a summer student to go in and make sure they get emptied on a regular basis. Um, but if you see something, say something, and we can all make our community better one step at a time. So um, we will open it up to our public question period, but I wanna have some questions for you too um, to help facilitate this discussion. So have you ever done a shoreline cleanup or a river cleanup? Why or why not? Um, have you made zero waste swaps at home? Why or why not? Um, often we hear people say the price point of certain products makes them inaccessible. So um, maybe that's a reason why not. I wanna hear from you. And then what is in your opinion, the biggest hurdle in tackling shoreline plastic pollution? Is it the size of the plastics that we see? Is it just <laughs> the sheer amount? Is it not knowing the source? 
let me know. I'm going to open up my question bar here and I am ready for your questions. So bring them on. Okay, I'm seeing people raising their hand, so I'm gonna allow to talk. I, I've never used this feature before, so we'll try. Sharon, I'm allowing you to talk. Sorry, okay, I, didn't know ahead, that Sharon. I didn't mean to raise my hand, so I must have clicked that by accident. Okay, I don't think this feature is working. That's too bad. Okay, write any of your questions in the um, in the question box below. Okay, we'll try that. Okay. Okay. Um, Fiona, do we know how much nano microplastic is out there? So the Coastal Center hasn't done any large scale studies on. How much nano and microplastic is out in our lake. Um, we have a lot of amazing contacts that have been doing studies for years on this, like Lisa Ertl out of the Plastic Solutions Lab, um, University of Toronto. There's also a really amazing PhD candidate out of Western that we've been working with. Um, she presented at our, at our municipal forum last year. Her name is escaping me right now, but she has done studies on um, plastic wash-ups around the lake. So all of their research that's being done um, is feeding into us, we're learning from it and, and away we go. So we are able to do different projects like the Microplastics Awareness Project through funding applications that we're successful in. So we can do these little small studies, um, but we haven't been able to do like a large trolling study throughout the entirety of Lake Huron. Kathy, you said when you had an office in Godrich. Oh yes, so we have closed our office, we've gone virtual, um, and this is in order to be more efficient with our donor dollars and we are still putting on all of our programming that we usually put on but we're just working from home right now until we find um, a more um, a better space for us something that works a little bit better um, for our needs and the COVID-19 thing kind of helped us on that journey to uh, work from home so we're finding that it's working really really well right now and although we don't have a, a permanent um, office that you can come and visit us at. We are definitely available through virtual means. Um, Lynn Archibald. Oh, hi Lynn. Um, I'm a big fan of the two minute beach cleanup. Always having a little bag or a big pocky every time I watch the beach, walk the beach. Yes, two minute beach cleanups are so easy. They're so easy to do with kids that have a short attention span. Um, and then, you know, uh, even as we get older, um, two or five minutes, you, you go on your beach, you set a timer on your phone, away you go. Um, so for that five minutes, you clean up, and then you see how you see what you have. You can take a picture of it, you can put it on social media, and spread more awareness of what you find. Sharon, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, Delphine, who is responsible for removing the hot tub that fell into the lake at Blue Water? <laughs> so that's an interesting question, actually, um, because it was the landowners hot tub that slid into the lake because of bluff erosion, I am assuming that they would be responsible for removing it off the shoreline. Uh, but I don't actually know um, what whatever came of that issue specifically. Kathy, how does Lake Huron compare to other Great Lakes in terms of plastic pollution? It's a really great question. So um, basically the larger and the deeper the lake, the harder it is to, to sample uh, the density of microplastics. So Lake Huron is amazing because we've had so many studies over the past like three to five years done on plastic pollution and plastic density in our lake. So I think um, the plastic lab out of University of Toronto has a comparison chart, um, but because Lake Superior and Lake Huron are the deepest lakes, it's really hard to get deep water samples. And actually our, our friends, Scott and Katie, a parent, did deep water samples on their paddle boards as they traveled the North Channel and down into Georgian Bay. Uh, amazing, amazing story. So if you haven't heard of those two, look them up, Scott and Acadia Parent. Um, I believe that Lake Huron is up there as one of the, the worst lakes, but I don't quote me on that. Um, I would have to get that study in front of me and show you the metrics. I'm all about the numbers. <laughs> 
are there gyres in the Great Lakes? That's a great question, Doug. Um, there, if you actually tune in to our webinar in two weeks from now, Coastal Processes will show how water moves through the lake. So uh, although there aren't gyres per se, like spinning um, water currents, there are currents that flow through the Great Lakes. So you'll see in that webinar through the maps and stuff I'll show you. Basically all the water comes down from Lake Superior, curls around Georgian Bay, curls around the Goddard Basin, so from Tobermory to Sarnia, and then goes down into that uh, St. Clair River at Sarnia. So we're constantly having that water flowing downwards, um, but no, no actual gyres. Uh, there are different coves and stuff where plastic can gather in those deposition areas, like I was talking about with the sand. Um, there are areas that see more plastic pollution every, every year than others. Um, do you have any infographic style sheets with data about plastics in the Great Lakes? I think there is one or two. If you go on our website, um, like Huron.ca, let me see if I can pull it up quickly. Uh, under our programs, we have our Butt Free Beach program, which again isn't running this year and it didn't run last year. And it talks about um, cigarette butts, um, our, what the Butt Free Beach program was, what beaches participated. And then uh, under programs, again, if you go to the Microplastics Awareness Project, then you can see uh, we have our, our small report sheet here um, and a small infographic here as well. Know your microplastics. Um, there's a ton of information on our website that you can dig through if you have time. Um, even uh, we have a page on our beach cleanups. So if you go up to programs again, sorry, and then shoreline cleanups, then you can see CR Plastic Products was our key sponsor for our cleanups this year. So they'll all be happening at the end of the year now instead of in the spring. We talk about past cleanup results, how to do a beach cleanup. There's some infographics here about um, shoreline cleanup protocols and the shoreline cleanup data card. So when you go to the beach, if you wanna do a, a shoreline cleanup and submit your data to the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, which is an amazing thing to do because they collect data all over the country, no matter if it's a big cleanup, small cleanup, if you're just going out there, you can take this data card, print it off, and then write on it once you get out onto the shoreline or even into the river valleys or small lakes, wherever you are. Um, and then you can submit that data card to the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. So hopefully, Sean, that answers your question. Uh, Delphine, what about Michigan side? Do they have a sense of responsibility? Uh, definitely do. We don't work closely with any organizations over there that do beach cleanups regularly, but we know that they happen. Um, we work with partners that are in the States and by that, I mean, we communicate with them um, and ask them, oh, are you seeing nurdles right now? Or um, have you had a huge wash up of fishing nets for some reason? We had one fishing net that washed up in Goderich that actually had a tag on it. So we were able to trace it to um, a fishing charter up on Manitoulin that just lost their net in a storm. We found, um, actually one of our coast watchers found a lid from a bait, like a live worm bait um, container that came from the States at the top of the mitten. And we were able to trace, trace it back and, and get a hold of them and say, hey, look what we found. Maybe you could switch to a biodegradable lid. Or the coast watcher was able to do that, I should say. But um, I mean, it's, it's a shared responsibility. Our Great Lakes are a shared resource. They're split almost 50-50 between both countries. So it is important for all of us to, to participate, whether we're American, Canadian, or, um, or both, you know. Um, Sarah, what beaches on Lake Huron contain the greatest amount of plastic pellets? Uh, I can't answer that specifically. I don't have the results in front of me from last year's cleanup. Um, you can find all of our data from our cleanups on the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup webpage. I believe if you look up the Coastal Center cleanups, you can find our individual data submissions. Because we have five or six years of data, it's really hard to sort through them all, but we do have all of that kind of stuff itemized. It's just a huge spreadsheet for me to look through. Debbie, shouldn't filter all filters, filters become mandatory for all washing machines? That's a great question. There have been a lot of um, people who have been advocating for that and even um, different coastal communities who have been encouraging it. 
the there are some barriers to their installation. Uh, you have to know how to install them. They're very easy to install, <laughs> but um, you basically just screw the, the device onto the wall. You put your out filter into it and then carry it on. Um, but if you're not good at plumbing like me, I'm, you know, I'm glad that I have somebody in my life that can do that kind of stuff for me. Um, that's a barrier. And then also the cost. So it can be very costly for some people. I think they're between 100 and 150 dollars so it's an added expense for a lot of people but i mean I, if you were to ask me i think that they should become mandatory um the only other thing with the filter all is that that micro filter net that's within them needs to be cleaned out and then that just gets thrown into the garbage so there's a little bit of maintenance required but really um for what you're doing for the environment it's it's a very little hassle hassle <laughs> in order to install one i think they're just amazing and and they should become mandatory joy i believe the sport fishing community is is a significant concern cigar tips fishing lure beads styrofoam coffee cups how do we educate this community to be more responsible can styrofoam beads be banned um a ban like this would probably have to come from like a municipal level or a provincial level in order to just blanket coat everything we do have good relationships, the Coastal Center and different marinas or uh, yacht clubs and the great uh, the Canadian Power and Sail Squadron. So education is always step number one. Educating people why they should uh, buy a different product or why um, what they're doing is harmful to the environment. So education is step number one. And then number two is for them to, um, to accept the change on their own. So, uh, and then of course, at the end of that, that's when bans and uh, bylaws come in handy because then it regulates that behavior. Sarah, do you collaborate with any Georgian Bay organizations about plastic pollution? Uh, we communicate with a lot of Georgian Bay organizations about plastic pollution. Um, we don't really partner with any right now on beach cleanups or anything like that. Um, most of the data that these organizations get from beach cleanups get submitted right to shoreline cleanup, the great Canadian shoreline cleanup that is. So um, if we wanted to access data, we could go through that channel. Um, but we are definitely open to collaborating with other organizations and, um, and other community groups. So there's always a possibility. Uh, another Sarah, uh, what is the most effective way to collect microplastics nerd or nurdles off the beach? <clears throat> it takes forever to pick them up. You're right. <laughs> it does. Um, the most efficient ways that we've found is through sifting devices. So either like um, those splatter guards or colanders, or um, there was an image in the presentation earlier of someone with like a giant filter. Um, and I can go back to that, or you can go back to it, I guess, too, if you want. Uh, Tony, how active is the Coast Guard in plastics cleanup? I have no idea. That's a really great question. Um, from what I understand, we've never worked with the Coast Guard on a plastics cleanup, but that's not to say that they wouldn't be willing to, to, uh, to do a cleanup with us. I don't think we've ever approached them really about one. So that's really interesting. Um, really interesting thing. So, um, it is 11, so I'll wrap up the discussion. If you have any follow-up questions or comments or um, any kind of communication, send it to coastalcenter at lakehuron.ca. The website's at the bottom of the page. Um, and we would love to talk with you more about this. <clears throat> uh, if you have more specific questions, a lot of our data is available on our website, lakehuron.ca. And we advertise all of our beach cleanups every year on our social media, through our website. You can find all of that information on upcoming events. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up. I know there's a few other questions here. Um, so I will try and answer those um, via email if you want to email the Coastal Center account. And um, otherwise, thank you so much for tuning in. This is webinar two of six. So we have a number of webinars coming up. The one in two weeks from now is all about um, Lake Huron coastal processes and lake levels. So that'll be a really interesting one. Um, the question about how do you purchase CR plastic products? Um, Home Hardware carries them and a number of other garden centers and stuff. Go onto their website, just Google them. 
Um, thank you everyone for attending the workshop. You've made it really special today and I hope I was able to answer a lot of your questions. Um, again, send any comments or questions to, to that email down below. Otherwise, thank you so much for, for tuning in and I will conclude things now. Okay, I hope you all have a great day.